I'm delighted to be here. I'm a Oregonian. Uh, I was born in 1952, left in 1984 after getting a PhD in planning from Portland State. I've been sending the message around the country ever since. Uh, first to Kansas State, then New Orleans, a long time at Georgia Tech, uh, a little less time at Virginia Tech, and now present at the University of Utah. Um, having seen the country, you know, join academia, see the world or something, uh, I, I can appreciate what's been accomplished in Oregon. In many respects, Oregon is the last state standing among the 15 or so states that launched uh, large-scale uh, uh, statewide planning programs in the 1960s and 70s. I've worked with many of those states, Florida in particular. Florida gutted their laws in the ninth, early, early 2000s, uh, and the result, and we're coming out with research on this, is that as a consequence of Florida's actions, gutting their planning programs statewide. They've increased unemployment, decreased wages, increased foreclosures, decreased economic development. And we're going to be proving that momentarily. So Oregon is on the right track. I'm delighted to be here for the 100, for the 40th anniversary of Senate Bowl. So let me walk through uh, my perception about the future of uh, the nation in some respects, but also focusing on uh, on the state and on particular metropolitan areas. A little background, more background. I, I was here at the beginning. I was actually a student intern uh, for the Joint Legislative Land Use Committee in 1972 that wrote the laws in 1973. They asked us to interview local officials, planning commissioners, elected officials in rural counties around the state, why they were recalcitrant in getting plans together by the 1971 deadline. What we learned was a lot of these commissioners, elected and planning commissioners, they wanted to do the right thing, they actually believed in planning, but they wouldn't touch it for fear of being recalled or not reelected. But what they wanted was uh, political cover. The devil makes me do it. Uh, that, was the, that was the message we got time and again, so these officials were saying, Salem, you tell us what we have to do so we can blame you uh, for doing the right thing. I think that was very important, and that led to uh, several uh, enforcement options, one of which was truly effective, and that was when LCDs would put, uh, would, would basically re-delegate back to the state building permit authority for a couple of counties, Columbia County and, and Curry County in the 19, uh, late 1970s. I think that sent the right message for everybody else to do the right thing. Um, I've been involved in, in litigation in the state, the one I'm particularly proud of is uh, Forest Grove passed a charter uh, amendment to its city uh, that would prohibit seasonal farm worker housing in the city. We have litigated, won that case, uh, and I think that set the, the right path for uh, banning exclusionary zoning in the state. Uh, a little more background, since I mentioned it, I was pretty active in, in Osberg. I was actually on the committee that hired Henry Richmond, uh, and we later on hired Bob Stacy, who's in the audience today. So Bob's future is owed to me. <laughs> uh, this, this diagram is, was uh, outlined on a napkin uh, during the first date with my wife. <laughs> this was my dissertation outline, and I was thinking through these uh, relationships. And so uh, casually at Jake's restaurant uh, 36 years ago, um, I outlined this, and she still dated me the next time. <laughs> I have, um, as was mentioned earlier, I, uh, you know, I publish, I have Paris yet. Uh, I have 23 books. These are some. These are the ones that basically uh, are tied directly to my experiences, personal and to, through uh, research on Oregon. The regulated landscape was translated into Chinese. Uh, growth management principles and practices it was decided by the APA as one of the top 25 books during its 25 years. Uh, urban containment in the United States is, is based largely on Oregon's experience. You see the Oregon Portland uh, landscape, uh, social impacts of urban containment, and so forth. So uh, I owe a lot of my success, whatever it is, to the experiences I have uh, as a planner uh, in Oregon. Uh, my latest two books, uh, Megapolitan Me America, uh, looks at how the United States is reforming itself into what we call megapolitan economic engines. Megapolitan areas are multi-metropolitan areas. This part of the country would have the Willamette Megapolitan Area, Portland, Salem, Albany, Corvallis, Eugene. They create a single economic engine. They talk to each other, well not during game days, but they talk to each other. They are their own world-class economic engine 
as other of these 23 uh, megapolitan areas. What's missing, for example, Kansas City, St. Louis, they don't talk to each other, even though they meet size relationships and distance relationships. Because they don't talk to each other, they're going to be on the waste heap of economic development in the future, likewise Memphis and uh, Nashville. So these parts of the country have what we call megapolitan envy. <laughs> the latest book is Reshaping Metropolitan America. It's on bookshelves today by several copies because I pledge my royalty proceeds to student scholarships. Uh, so by one, by many, give them as gifts and so on and so forth. So I'm going to draw a lot of information from this book uh, in my presentation today. I'll talk about uh, trends and preferences of, as, as I see them. Uh, trends in population, uh, trends in sort of demand by household, uh, housing by household type and age, ownership rates, development estimates, and somewhat about housing type preferences. As backdrop, we all know things like, you know, the subprime mortgages are history. They should never been around. They, they, they cost the economy dearly. Uh, they're gone, thankfully. Uh, but in, in, in their stead, we, you know, we're now seeing 20% down payments as a matter of routine by many and a larger uh, number of banks. Uh, for context, two-thirds of Americans who own their homes put less than 20% down on their homes. So if the new monitor is 20% down for most of the new home mortgages, uh, then we're going to see a decline in home ownership rate, which we've already seen. Uh, I think the implication is smaller homes and smaller lots, uh, even more people per unit. Uh, and more renters, including perhaps double up renters. <coughs> so let's look at some of the numbers. Uh, these are, I apologize for the small print, uh, but all of this is going to be in a PDF available for the LCDC, and also I think put on the LCDC's uh, website. So this will be public domain, uh, matter, probably a matter of, of a few hours after my presentation. So between 2010 and 2030, we see the U.S. growth, the, the growth in Oregon, uh, paralleling basically the same growth rate as the U.S. Uh, but notice in all the, you know, the metropolitan areas focusing on, say, the, the Portland Hillsboro area, notice the, what I call the new majority. The, by 2043, the census tells us that most Americans will be not, be not white non-Hispanic. They'll be minority. So if a minority is the new majority, I call that new group the new majority. That's who they are, and that's, uh, that's how we need to respect the population changes. 86% of the population change in the U.S. between 2010 and 2030 will be among the new majority. 73% in Oregon, uh, fairly close to the national average. 84% in Hillsboro, in Portland, Hillsboro. Uh, oddly, uh, just 11% in Bend, uh, different demographics there, but Bend is actually a fairly small metropolitan area. Uh, Salem will be actually all the growth in Salem metropolitan area will be among the new minority and will actually see a decline in the white non-Hispanic population over the next 20 years. Uh, the aging population, 65 plus, uh, again, Oregon parallels the U.S. pretty much. Uh, the U.S. half of the growth uh, between now and 2030 will be among those who are uh, aging over 65, but about the same in Oregon. Uh, pretty wide differences among metropolitan areas. Uh, Portland, uh, oddly enough, is out of 36%. It's a fairly young area. Uh, people are moving into it, young people are moving into it. So Portland, Oregon is a dynamic, youth-attracting area, much like Austin would be, as well as Dallas. But other parts of the, of the state have uh, fairly high uh, projected uh, uh, changes of population shares among the, the, the elderly, Albany, Corvallis, Lebanon, uh, leading the path. Uh, looking at net change in households by type, this would be households with children, households without children, and households who are single-person households, a subset of households without children. Between 2010 and 2030, nationally, 13% of the net change in new households will have children in them, 87% won't. Now, I'm a baby boomer. During my youth, more than half of new American households in terms of net change have children in them. Now we're down to 13% going out to 2030. So if we're in the business of anticipating land use changes uh, and housing changes, we need to plan for this population, not that population. Uh, also, in the U.S. as a whole, and pretty close uh, to in Oregon, more than half of the net change in population um, among households will be households who are single-person households. 
This is because the baby boomers are aging along, they're losing their partners, and young people are pairing up later in life, and so we have the, the one-two combination leading to this being the single largest growth share of the housing market in the U.S. and Oregon uh, for the next 20 years, my sense is for the next 40 years in this country. And you can see similar figures for all the rest of the metropolitan areas. Um, net change in households by age. Now, pay attention. This, is, this takes me a little while to explain, but I think you'll get it. I divide the housing market broadly and crudely into three large-scale age brackets. Those whose household heads are under 35, they're young, they're starter households, they're after apartments and condos and townhouses and small homes and small lots and, and whatnot. Then you have the those who are between 35 and 64. This housing, this household group is in their peak housing consumption period of life. Growing families, good incomes, dual incomes, uh, and suburban communities and developers are going out of the way to attract this kind of demographic because they spend money. They're good people. Uh, then we have the then we have the the other the, the uh, over 65. These are empty nesters, downsizers. So if I was to pick one housing demographic to to hang my hat on for making good money as a developer, and I am a developer, and I, and I consult developers, it would be that middle group between 35 and 64. That's where the money is. That's where the demand is for building larger homes and larger lots, usually in the suburbs. Uh, so between, so this chart shows between, uh, I should have said between 1990, 2030, but look at this upper bracket here, 1990, 2010, for the US, 77% of the net change in housing demand was attributable to those at the peak part of their lifespan in buying homes. Boomers coming of age in buying homes. 23% were 65 plus. There was actually a decrease in single in, in households at the, uh, the lowest end. Uh, Oregon followed pretty much the national pattern. Uh, and, and the metropolitan areas largely I did as well. But look at the next brackets between 2010 and 2030 for the US as a whole, only 16% of the net change in demand for the households who want the homes, the larger homes, probably in the suburbs, is gonna be one fifth of that going forward as it was in the past. 74% will be the empty nesting, downsizing. 10% will be among the starter home households. Basically, 84% of the next 20 years, or really of the next 35 years of the housing market, will be for the smaller homes, smaller lot, apartment, condo, townhouse market. So you may have the situation fixed in Oregon. You probably have it better fixed in other places. But around the country, suburban jurisdictions that are stuck in the baby boom time war are in for a very rude awakening in terms of housing market dynamics. And across the, uh, the state, uh, pretty much these, these same these trends hold true. Uh, Portland Metro is a little lower than the national average, again, because it's attracting a younger uh, demographic, much like Austin would be in other parts of the country. So this, I want to talk about this for a second also. What a difference a generation makes. This chart puts the, uh, puts the, the national figures into context. But look at the bottom. These are national numbers. I couldn't get local numbers. This is from the American Housing Survey. Between 1989 and 2000, and roughly the same 20-year period as we see here, uh, we built 25 million new homes in the U.S. Uh, 21 million of them, or 85%, were detached homes. So uh, on the whole, we did a pretty good job in the market meeting the demand with the supply. You know, maybe a little more detached homes than the, the demand, but, but pretty close. Uh, 20, uh, about a third of all homes that were over 20, about a third of all detached homes built were over 2,500 square feet. The figure that stunned me, and I checked and double checked and rechecked, is that among the single family detached homes built between 1989 and 2009, 
42% were on lots of between one half acre and 10 acres across the US. Now, it's very different in Oregon. I mean, I've got those numbers somewhere deep in my computer somewhere, but the national picture is, is stunning, frankly, just stunning to me. So, uh, we're going to be seeing some uh, softening of home ownership rates. We already have seen that around the country. I think you probably sense that. This chart shows the home ownership rates between 1965 to the end of 2012, peaking at 69 percent. Can't quite do it uh, in uh, 2005. Now, I blame the decline since the peak in 2005 on our cat. <laughs> Now, in between 2002 and 2008, um, I was living in Alexandria, Virginia. I actually started the Virginia Tech planning program in Alexandria. In 2005, our cat, Valentine Nelson, I don't know how the bank got the name of our cat, but she got a note in the mail saying she's been pre-approved <laughs> for a half million dollar note. <laughs> Better terms than we have. <laughs> All she had to do was put her paw print on the letter, send it back in, and get a voucher to use to buy home. Well, she didn't, and the housing market collapsed. <laughs> um, a key piece of demographic changes and ownership changes, changes are due to the aging population. Now, many of us here are baby boomers. This chart shows the number of people who are uh, 65 and over uh, across the U.S. between 1970 and project to, projected to the year 2040. The, the steep incline, of course, is the boomers will be turning 65 between 2011 and 2029. Uh, I did some special studies uh, for the book, actually, that, that discovered that when you turn 65, you don't die. <laughs> um, I think Steve Schell thanks me for that part. Um, but more importantly, when you turn 65 this year, you will probably live to be nearly 80 before you pass on. In 1950, when you turn 65, you wouldn't see, uh, you, I'm sorry, when you turn 65, this year you could be living to your middle 80s, middle 80s. When you turn 65 in 1950, you might expect to live to be in the early 70s, according to actual, actuarial tables. We are doing better in terms of living longer through medical interventions, advances. Yes, improving diet, despite what we see around the country. Uh, we're getting better at aging. And so uh, the latest issue of uh, uh, National Geographic actually says there is solid scientific evidence suggesting that babies born even now, certainly by 2020, can expect to live to be 120. I sold insurance going to, to, to college, to put my way through college. At that point in time, in the dark ages, called the 1970s, the actuarial tables went to 100. Now they go to 120. In the mid-1970s, IRS required everybody to cash out their IRAs by 100. Now it's 113. So, these organizations know something we should pay attention to, and that's the fact that we're living longer, <coughs> and we should expect to be living longer. Uh, we need to come to grips with that in our land use planning as well as our policies. Um, a key uh, effect of the aging population is changing ownership patterns. So this, this particular chart done by Al Myers in Southern California shows the buy-sell rates uh, between among the five-year age cohorts. So as we start out in life, uh, we will buy up as, well, as our needs change, we'll buy and sell, and so buying and selling will increase in our early up to our uh, mid-30s or thereabouts, 40s, uh, begin to tail off. But by the time we get our late 60s, our probability of, of, of selling homes will exceed our probability of buying homes. Well, the baby boomers will, will start turning 70 in 2016. So I am predicting, you're among the few groups We've heard this. I'm predicting that by 2016, we will begin to see across many parts of the U.S., probably not Oregon, but many other parts of the U.S., uh, far more sellers of homes than buyers of homes as seniors want to unload. It's what I call the great senior sell-off. It will begin in 2016. 
Now, I say that, I say this because look at what happens when people who are uh, to their, their ownership patterns when people uh, turn over 70. 82% of people over 65 own their own homes. It's the largest ownership uh, rate among uh, uh, age cohorts. Uh, at 70 years and over, 4% of, of those homeowners sell their homes annually. 4% is not a big number, but 4% each year times 20 years becomes a really big number. 52% of all people over 70 who sell their homes rent. If you go to 80, uh, two-thirds of all people selling their homes over 80 rent. So this is going to start hitting the U.S. economy and many parts of the country, the Great Lakes states, the Middle West, some of the Northeast states, uh, very hard beginning in 2016 as we'll see more, uh, more people selling their homes and buying their homes. And this chart is also developed by Dallas Myers in Southern California. This shows by state the buy-sell relationship in 2020. So Oregon here in 2020 we'll see more buyers of homes than sellers. That's a good thing. Uh, in my state, Utah, again, more buyers of homes than sellers. But look at the number of states, including California, the number of states where we'll see more sellers of homes than buyers, as seniors will begin to unload their homes by the end of this decade and then out for the next two decades. Uh, this will have uh, very dramatic implications for the housing market across the country. Another trend that I see going on is is gasoline prices. This chart shows the uh, gasoline prices weekly average from 2002 to uh, actually the uh, uh, beginning of 2013. Uh, we have a little, a little problem here called the Great Recession, but this is a trend line, a 0.7 R-squared trend line that indicates to me that we could probably expect to see in an area of $8 per gallon of gasoline by 2020 and $15 per gallon of gasoline by 2030. Uh, now, this is important. Between 2002 and the end of 2012, gasoline prices rose 10% per year compounded on average. 10% per year compounded. Wages increased 3% per year compounded. And as, as we saw earlier, uh, between 2007 and 2010, Oregonian wages actually fell. They're, they're coming back. But the point is that gasoline prices are rising faster than wages, and that is going to continue for the future because we, we now have a world fossil fuel market, despite all the fracking taking place in the U.S. and Canada. In fact, the U.S. and Canada will become uh, net world exporters of fuel by the end of the 2020s. Um, that will not affect gasoline prices by, any, by, by my estimations. What this also means is that when I consult with builders and, and homeowner associations, or, uh, builder association around the country, we're seeing for the first time that prospective home buyers are beginning to hedge their bets. Do they want to live 20 miles away from the workplace when they have to engage in that commute? Or will they trade off a smaller home on a smaller lot or attached home to hedge their bets on gasoline price increases? And they are. Not everybody, but we're seeing this growing a trend where people are internalizing the expectation of ever increasing gasoline prices with respect to income. So all this suggests to me that we're seeing, uh, we're going to see a, a reduction in the home ownership rates. Uh, this is also done, this is also confirmed by the ULI, the uh, uh, provincial real estate analysts and so forth. Uh, basically consensus, as far as I can tell, indicates that by 2030, We'll have a home ownership rate of 63% in this country, down from 66% in 2010, which means that of all new residential units built between 2010 and 2030, to get to a 63% home ownership rate by 2030, it means that basically half of all new homes built will have to be for renters. Now, that won't happen. Half of all new homes built will not be for renters. But what's going to happen is that millions of owner-occupied homes will flip to renter-occupied homes, or barring local zoning code uh, regulations to the contrary, many of these homes will become split tenure. The owner lives in the home and rents 
uh, the basement or rent something out of the home. I don't know where Oregon sits on that, but other states actually uh, tell local governments they cannot prohibit uh, dual uh, tenure uh, in the same home. However, not to be, actually I do this presentation around the country, on the east coast I'm known as Dr. Gloom, on the west coast I'm known as Dr. Doom. So if we roll the numbers out to 2030, if we take the home ownership rates for 2010 and hold them constant across all racial and ethnic groups, considering their individual home ownership rates, and then assume a 5% reduction in ownership rates across all groups, which we are at now, we're at that now, it means that by 2030, the national ownership rate will be 60%, which means that two-thirds of all new homes built between now and then will have to be for renters. I think this is the more realistic path. 60% home ownership rates by 2030. Again, considering 20% down payments, tighter underwriting rules, uh, and the rest of it. Nonetheless, in my book, I choose the conservative home ownership rate figures, this one, uh, and, I, and I, I, I estimate home ownership rates across all metropolitan areas in the state of Oregon, and the renter share of change at the bottom, again, Oregon mimicking pretty much the United States in terms of share of renter change, uh, and look at Portland, 52% of the net change in new units would be for renters. Uh, Salem, 59%, then 35% uh, at the low end, but again, it's a, it's a small, unique metro. Uh, so these are important trends to fathom as we go forward uh, in this state and this, in this country. In this particular chart, look at the right-hand side. We actually built homes, surprise, surprise, between 2004 and 2012. We added about 7.9 million new homes. But when you look at the change in renters among occupied homes, I discover a relationship indicating that 83% of the addition to the housing stock in the U.S. between 2004-2012 were for renters during that period of time. What we're doing now is we're recasting, resorting the housing market, catching up to where the market is headed. I would not be surprised that if by 2015, home ownership rates will be at 64%, or maybe down as low as 62% by, 20, by 2020. Um, okay, so I worry about where we are in our planning processes, where we are in estimating or anticipating the, where the market is going in terms of wanting certain kinds of housing options. Uh, so I did a study in 2006, published by the Journal of the American Planning Association, where I looked at a dozen builder developer driven surveys not by planners or CR club I wouldn't trust those surveys I'm looking at builder surveys who are informing their builder clients where the market is going what the market wants and these surveys basically uh, decompose the housing market into attached products owner uh, occupied uh, townhouses condos or uh, apartments uh, cooperatives small lots, those that are under, say, one-sixth of an acre, or that's about 7,200 square feet, and conventional lots, basically everything else. Um, my, my survey of surveys, published in 2006, indicated that 38% of Americans wanted the option to live in some attached product. 37% wanted the option to live in a small lot option, and the rest, 25%, the larger or conventional lot option. R.C. Elko, uh, Robert Charles Lesser Company, uh, one of the better known, maybe, maybe well, among the best market firms in the country, at their own expense basically said, let's look to see if the good Dr. Nelson is correct. So their own in-house survey focused on owner-only demand. Mine was on owner and renter demand combined. Their survey was on owner-only demand and came up with roughly the same answers among owners. The National Association of Realtors did a survey in 2011, uh, and their survey conform, conforms with my survey. Uh, now, mine was a survey of surveys. Theirs was a real survey of 2,000 people across the country, a uh, very high confidence level. The American Housing Survey, AHS, for 2011, reports for us the actual supply of units by each category. So, from my perspective, if three completely different surveys using three completely different techniques, say essentially the same thing, 
it should tell us that this is probably where the market is. The American Housing Survey tells us where the supply is, and you can look at the supply demand figures comparing the NAR numbers with the AHS numbers. Uh, the supply for attached at 28%, demand is 38%, supply for small lot is 29%, compared to demand for 37%. Conventional lot demand is 25%, conventional lot supply is 43%. So when you go to Zillow.com, when you go to their underwater index, you will see vast swaths of the U.S., mostly suburban counties across the U.S., where 60, 70, 80 percent of the homes in suburban America, large lot, conventional lot suburban homes, are worth less than the mortgages. And that's available on Zillow.com. Just take a look. So I use the NAR survey to forecast the demand for housing by type, attached, small lot, conventional lot, to the year 2030, looking at demand by age group, uh, 18 to 29, 30, 39, and so on and so forth, and we have numbers up to 60 plus. Uh, they're doing another survey now and asking the NAR to include a more refined uh, age-related breakdowns. But look, uh, our demand for attached products goes down as we age, and then go back up as we age uh, after the mid, after our 40s. Demand for tax products or small lot products kind of goes up and then levels, but our demand for conventional lots increases as we uh, as our age increases and wealth increase and then goes down. So rolling these numbers forward, I find that by 2030, if we built no in the U.S. if we built no new homes on conventional lots between now and 2030, we would still have 28 million more homes on those lots in 2011 than the market demands. The market wants attached and small lots. The market no longer wants the conventional. Now, every market's different, every much culinary is different. You'll always find some market for the larger lots. But I'm looking at the mass market demand across the US. Um, so where do we go from here? Uh, this is our new promised land. You have a few of these in, in across the state, a few of these in all the metropolitan areas. This is a dead or dying commercial strip. This is about 10 acres of land, uh, five miles from downtown Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, but this is our future. Uh, this, is our, this is our future because there, there are thousands of these larger tracts of land uh, up and down commercial corridors in every metropolitan area in the U.S. Uh, they are under single ownership. They have single purpose. They want to, to make money. They're fronting a lot of ways that are four, six, eight lanes wide. It's easy to put in a bus rapid transit or a trolley or some other transit. You can easily dig up the infrastructure in the right of way and replace it to upgrade the, the capacity. Uh, these, are, these are ready made redevelopment sites. And oh, by the way, behind here is a residential subdivision that is fit to be tied if the backyard is a dead or dying strip. Center. So we can turn these potential NIMBYs not in my backyard into NIMBYs, yes, in my backyard, to fix this problem to add to their value and also give them more opportunities. Now, one of the reasons why these things are such an opportunity is that uh, the buildings themselves are not built to last very long. This chart shows the, the average uh, useful life of uh, major products, retail, office, and so on. Uh, look at the far right-hand side. The average useful life of a home is about 170 years. So when I confront planners around the country for long-range planning, I say that when you plan, when you approve a residential development, you take that land out of consideration forever for alternative land uses. Uh, how do I get this, this, to this number? Three different data sets, Census, Department of Energy, and American Housing Survey, Three completely different data sets allow me to estimate or triangulate on the useful life of homes, uh, and it's 170 years. Not, the home, not that the homes are built to last that long. We will make them last that long. There are vessels to society. There are homes, and we'll keep our home afloat. We'll, put, we'll repair the roof. We'll add on new rooms. We'll rewire everything else needed. But it's the other land uses where, we're, where the opportunity exists for us to rebuild or reshape uh, the U.S. The average life of a retail structure is 20 years, office is about 60 years, warehouse is about 25 years. The overall average is, is about 45 years. But that assumes no change in land values of the underlying property. 
So this particular chart estimates or shows for planners the more realistic sense of how we can convert these uh, aging commercial strips and commercial properties into redevelopment opportunities. When we open the doors of a brand new single floor target today, let's say, 80% of the whole property value is in the structure, roughly. 20% is, uh, is, is in the land. Uh, a target will have about a 20, about a 50 year useful life, according to Marshall Swift, uh, an IRS. And so it'll depreciate at 2% two, two per year, not compounded, 2% two, two per year straight line. But the land value in a growing metropolitan area will increase by roughly the rate of growth of the metropolitan area. So a quarter of the metropolitan area growing at 1.5% per year will probably see an underlying land value increase of at least that much after inflation. So what we see is that by, the, by about the year uh, 30, thereabouts, the land is worth more than the building. Some, some years before, and certainly some years after, the owner of the site says, if the land is worth more than the, my building, I need to do something. I need to achieve a higher and better use. So we can actually predict, provided we have the data, usually from the, from the assessor's office, we can predict within five year periods um, when each and every non-residential parcel in any metropolitan area in the US, this is Salt Lake County, is ripe for conversion to some other use. This is color coded, the darker the color is, the more immediate the redevelopment opportunities are. Planners can say, go to the owners in this area here and say, well, you know, by the year 2020, in your cases, the land is worth more than the structures. Why don't we plan now for something else that makes more sense for you? Let's engage the neighbors to make sure they're on board. And maybe we can increase the floor area ratio. That's the relationship between the built structure and the land area. Increase the floor area ratio from 0.2, which is what it is now, to say 0.5, which still allows parking, even without transit options, uh, and create more mixed land uses. We can do those things beginning right now. If we do those things, my estimation is that we can actually accommodate all of America's new development on existing parking lots. Now, to put the parking lots into perspective, nobody has yet in literature, and I've searched the literature, nobody has yet estimated the asphalt volume of non of non-residential off-street parking. I'm not talking about the residential pads, I'm not talking about the on-street parking, but I estimate using judgments that people have not yet refuted. <laughs> See, we know it's true. But, you know, I'm a professor. <laughs> I have a license. The, I estimate the total land area in the U.S. of non-residential parking lots exceeds the land area of the state of Massachusetts. Hence, we can double and triple the FARs on existing parking, you know, structures on existing parking lots and more than accommodate all the nation's future development needs. Now, you, for some reason I'm going on, I'm going to go on a tangent. My, the book after next, is going to be called America at One Billion People. And they'll have all kinds of reasons for it. By the year 2100, the years will be at one billion people. We're 300 million people, not 310 million. Where will they go? We can actually accommodate all one billion people in the U.S. on existing parking lots <laughs> at a density that's half European suburban densities. <laughs> Get that picture. So this chart shows the uh, another angle to this. I'm looking at the, the job, the job changes, but um, but look at the bottom of the lines here. So I estimate the amount of square feet in non-residential spaces for the US current and projected and the state of Oregon and, and the metropolitan areas. And let's look at Oregon for instance. Uh, so I estimate that by that in 2010, 
Uh, we had, I don't show it here. I need to have that a line, sorry about this. But there's about 1.2 billion square feet of non-residential space in Oregon as of 2010. Um, we will we will tear down actually 722 million of that between now and 2030. Um, our total space to be built is about 1.8 billion square feet, including new space for new jobs. Uh, those combined means that we'll be building 1.7 times more space by 2030 than existed in 2010. If we're tearing down and rebuilding such large amounts of space, that's why I say we can accommodate all new development on these existing 0 0.2, 0 0.2 FAR uh, spaces. In addition, we have the so-called, what I see as the pent up demand for non-residential redevelopment. We had a thing called the recession between 2008 and 2010. We're still feeling the effects of it. We, uh, we have not been replacing the non-residential stock as quickly as the market says we should be because of, uh, of the recession. So I estimate that whereas the average annual rate of change, a rate of construction of all non-residential spaces should be about 2.75 billion square feet per year across the US, we'll be seeing 3.7 billion square feet per year built between 2014 and 2018. These will be the largest volumes of construction ever seen in the US history for any given year. And most of that, three quarters of that, are teardowns and rebuilds. So we have an opportunity for the rest of this decade to reshape metropolitan America. So in my sense, we have an opportunity that's once in a lifetime. We need to recast our residential planning, our residential opportunities, because we have 20 years of a residential mismatch that we have to fix. We'll have five years or so of record on residential construction that gives us a unique opportunity to recast our commercial corridors, commercial nodes, taking unparalleled advantage of, advantage of maybe adding transit, transit options, because again, all new, all new development, residential and non-residential, could go on existing parking lots and still be less than European style suburban density. Thank you very much. I do live in Salt Lake City, it's 5,000 feet. Two years ago, uh, Jupiter was as close to Earth as it had been in 40 years. I took my handheld camera outside and shot Jupiter and its four moons. <laughs> so I'm showing it off. Thank you. <laughs> Saturn is the opportunity this year, I understand. Saturn is the opportunity. A little more difficult to choose. Tom Grabber, if I would like to use your statistics sometime, which of the 35 books is the best purchase? <laughs> uh, the last one, else. obviously. And I pledge my royal deed to student scholarship. <laughs> Are there questions from the commission? Well, it's highly provocative stuff. But let me ask this question. And I'm not sure, since both the uh, our academics have a connection to Portland State. Well, we have some pending legislation that have, that will uh, engage Portland State to do the population projecting on which our land use decisions are made. And are, are they mindful of this kind of data about the shifting demographics and demands so that that will be factored into the decisions that are going to be guiding our expansion of our urban growth boundaries? I don't know about Portland State. I do know the population centers in many other states. Uh, and the short answer is no. Um, most demographic centers uh, only spin out numbers of people uh, and uh, demographics, age, race, ethnicity, uh, education perhaps, income perhaps but they don't take the next step and convert those to housing unit demand. I can do that, uh, but most population centers don't take that step, which is logical for a planning process. But I don't know about PSU, I, could, I can't say for sure. Thank you.
the, the short answer, Greg, is uh, Dr. Nelson is exactly right. What we're buying does not take it the next step. Mm -hmm. so what, what that suggests to me is, I mean, that, that, that we, I mean, I think it's great to have an academic source, like well, our, our proposal pending in the legislature, but uh, what we probably need to do is make sure that that is a dynamic process and it continues to, to uh, factor in all the information that's available. What you need to do is add a line in the legislation linking the Metropolitan Research Center at the University of Utah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, this is a question for Dr. Adler. Um, it's a two-part question, and, and I may have my dates wrong, but I think you said that uh, there was a, yeah, we came close to having uh, a national policy regarding land use in 1972. Legislation was in Congress between 70 and finally fell off the table in 75. Okay, so my question is, um, what caused it to fall off the table? That's that's part A, and part B is has there been any further discussion at the national level about a land use policy? What caused it to fall off the table? Opposition primarily from smaller places in the United States. Uh, U.S. Chamber of Commerce was opposed to federal intervention in this area. Uh, environmentalists, interestingly enough, at the national level, weren't all that excited about land use planning. They were concerned about other kinds of issues at the time. And so it was a combination of some opposition, and then it also got caught up in Watergate. And so the Nixon administration had actually been supportive of some version of a national land use policy. But became preoccupied with other things at precisely that time. And so support from the White House also. So yes, since then, there was a time uh, in the late 70s when we did national urban growth policy reports. And national commissions we're dealing with issues of uh, intermetropolitan migration, interregional migration, and there were a few national urban policy reports submitted during the Carter administration. But then, starting in the 1980s, no longer much interest at the national level in national level urban policy. Dr. Nelson, uh, we in Oregon always like to think we're the best at land use. Remember Rightfully that. so. <laughs> well, I wanted to ask, um, what other jurisdictions might we look to to <coughs> learn from? Um, we do think we're the best, but we also know we can always learn from other jurisdictions. Who should we look at? Um, it's difficult to answer that question. But I'm going to answer it differently. I think that um, one reason we've seen a decline in state level engagement in local land use planning, with the exception of Oregon and maybe another couple states, is that a lot of other jurisdictions have ramped up their planning capacity. And so this book uh, here, uh, The New Politics of Planning, that was published by the Urban Institute a couple of years ago. What my co-author, Rob Lang, and I found was that 30 years ago, 40 years ago, it made tons of sense to prescribe for local governments what they had to include in plans. Because the number of qualified planners was so small uh, that, in a, in a sense, you were telling planners what to do because they couldn't do it on their own, most of them. Uh, and the consulting companies had to have guidance uh, and so we probably elevated the quality of plans through state-level prescriptions. But in the meantime, we've tripled, quadrupled the number of really good planners. We now have uh, AICP certified planners. Uh, and we have a lot of planning networks. And they keep learning from each other. 
Uh, and so in some respects, there are some elements of planning around the country that are done better than in Oregon. Oregon on the whole does better. But in functional areas, I think other metropolitan areas actually do better but function by function. But this is because planners are becoming more and more informed and are becoming better. So earlier today, when I was sitting in the conversations here, um, I was struck by the conversations about the, the new rule on uh, uh, greenhouse gas reduction, whatever it is, setting the, the, the goals, but leaving it to local governments to figure out the best way they would individually achieve those goals. Planners at the local level are now better able to figure out locally how to do that. They couldn't do that years ago. Now they can. Good point. Thank you. Quick question. Sort of yes. To follow up on that, um, are there any specific jurisdictions that are really ahead of the curve with dealing with this housing um, supply and demand imbalance that you're projecting for the future? I mean, is any any urban area or community way ahead of the curve in providing the type of housing that will be needed for the seniors? <laughs> well, there is a federal law, uh, I don't know the details, um, but basically there's a preemption that if you are proposing a senior residential facility, uh, you have certain preemption authority in rezoning processes to get those constructed. Uh, again, uh, people like Steve Shell and Bob Stacy would know more about that than I do, uh, but why do we limit it to senior housing? You know, we should open that law up to federal law. Um, California, not too long ago, required most or maybe all, maybe all jurisdictions to create the opportunity for over-the-counter accessory dwelling unit permit. Um, because they have a severe housing problem and they recognize it and they have a solution for it. So I think Oregon might look to California for accessory dwelling unit examples, because I think that's something we need to uh, allow as across the counter permitting options uh, across the country. Um, I think you need to look at uh, bus rapid transit uh, more carefully than you might have already for uh, across the country. Uh, Portland, perhaps, Eugene is doing it. Um, as a matter of fact, uh, I would say that Eugene is doing it right. So uh, I did a study that's going to be published in a couple of months by the Journal of Public Transportation that indicates that the Eugene BRT system actually generates economic development. In other words, people are doing info against those right. routes. Right. Right. Um, the Portland light rail system has been very successful for the most part. Uh, and so we've taken lessons from the Portland light rail, light rail system and, and applied them to Salt Lake City and Dallas and so forth. So, I don't know, it's difficult for me to sort of go through who's done better. Uh, you can find some examples of doing better. Um, but again, on the whole, Oregon has been leading the path. Uh, and I would have to say, actually, Earl Blumenauer mentioned this to me one day. He says, I'm more effective away from Oregon <laughs> as an academic than in Oregon because nobody knows I'm from Oregon when I write from Georgia Tech or Utah, and they say, oh, a third party is now saying the Oregon planning program. <laughs> 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 Other comments or questions? Yes, Jennifer. Um, I'm interested in the Oregon Planning Commission for John Horvick. The, the survey data showed there was quite a distinct difference in some of the key attitudes between uh, younger demographics and older demographics. Do you have any way of measuring, or you at least have a hunch, as to whether those will change? As pe do people age into certain attitudes? Or do we have a, a, a generation coming along that we can expect will be more um, uh, supportive of some of the key goals in our program? Or less supportive. Or less supportive. Well, the way I saw it. <laughs> well, we go more towards the hunches, but here's some of the work that we've done. We recently did some focus groups with um, with youth about what their, their housing so preferences might be in the future. And they're certainly looking more towards uh, living in, in denser neighborhoods that they grew up in. So a lot of suburban kids are looking towards urban areas. And it's not just imagining living in New York City, right? It's imagining living in even a community like Bend, 
where they, but they can live close to amenities that they care about, parks, the coffee shop. They're right. imagining the, they're imagining themselves in communities like that, close to transit. And we see that also in trends around driving. And we know that younger folks are driving much less than previous generations, and they're also much likely to even have their license. And so they're they're becoming much more interested in choosing to live a lifestyle uh, in urban areas, relying on transit from previous generations. So as a reflection of their of their attitudes and their behaviors, we're certainly seeing that now. Um, people aren't very good at really saying what they're going to do, you know, 20, 30 years from now. But they're that's where they think they're going to be, and they're making choices now in their lifestyles that suggest that they're living differently. Thank you very much. Rob, thank you for bringing us this wealth of talent. It, what's unusual in this setting is to hear so many new things, so much new information. I just wanted to say that uh, thanks one last time to the panel. I, I didn't have to convince any one of these folks. I asked them, and they, uh, every one of them said yes and didn't have to be asked a second time. Wow. I wanted to thank uh, Chris, who's been very uh, generous with his time and resources in getting here. Uh, 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 John's firm actually did some, a pro bono poll just for the, for the presentation today without even being asked. I didn't even know about that today. And Sai has always been a, a friend and assistant of the program for many years and, and jumped at the chance to be here today, and I just wanted to thank him one more time. So before we break up, uh, the party continues. Um, at 6 o'clock, we will reconvene uh, in the Capitol. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with the building, uh, you walk in, you lucky people, uh, you walk in uh, on what is uh, the north side, and there's the rotunda. And then there's an information desk and immediately behind it, there's an area where we'll have some food and some drinks set up. Uh, we'll have about 15 minutes of program.